I wanted to start us off by sort of thinking about your backstory. How did you realize that philosophy and metaphysics had ignored the role of psychedelics, and why does it need to incorporate them? Um, gosh, well, I, I, uh, I mean, so yeah, my my backstory is philosophy of mind. I was teaching philosophy of mind and metaphysics really um, for many years, and um, and then I I read William James's um, book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, where he took he kind of first combines mystical type consciousness mystical experience with drug intake uh, which before then were kind of separated you know for, and he he started really this the modern psychology of scientific study of, of mysticism anyway so i was i was sort of teaching that in a college in london and um i had never personally had experiences like this myself although i was very interested in consciousness and um and then i did i found these little magic mushrooms locally here in cornwall and I tried some, and it was quite, yeah, an eye opener to say the least, or eye closer. And um, I, I, uh, yeah, no, I had, I thought, my God, this is, you know, incredible. There are incredible forms of phenomenology here. So I thought, okay, I better look at the, all the literature about it. And I was kind of disappointed to discover there wasn't much really. I mean, so there was William James, and he had written about it before as well. Uh, Benjamin Paul Blood, who had written about nitrous oxide before William James, and inspired James actually. Few other people I discovered later. I mean, obviously the classics like Huxley. But he wasn't really a philosopher, you know. Um, Gerald Hurd, again, not quite a philosopher in the academic sense. Um, but there were there were some, you know, uh, Walter Stace, um, although he wrote about mysticism rather than drugs as such. Anyway, so the point is there wasn't relatively much literature in it, and so then I thought, okay, I'm going to have to like uh, write something yeah. about it, at least tell people about what happened to me and and <laughs> sort of show them it from a philosophical perspective, and. Um, and yeah, and that sort of uh, that was well, quite a number of years ago now, fifteen years ago. So maybe no, was it that long? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Remember. Anyway, and then I, <clears throat> yeah, made a career out of it really. Although I did my PhD <laughs> in pan psychism because there were no existed no one who could supervise such uh, right PhD right. No, uh, we'll get into pan psychism. I I mean, I'm just wondering and why you think that psychedelics kind of were ignored in philosophy it's interesting because you say that you know in your books people like whitehead and, and nietzsche they were you know taking them thinking about them um and and yet so maybe it was the 60s and and afterwards them being banned um I mean, why do you think it, well, they kind yeah. of were sort of made obscure it's interesting history i don't think whitehead took them nietzsche certainly took okay a lot right of books, yeah but i did do it in my book um an analysis from Whitehead's point of view on psychedelic drugs um i don't think he took them although he was <laughs> in mystical state certainly um, why, um, oh, very complex. I mean, yeah, so a lot, a lot of intellectuals at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, mid, you know, uh, 19th century were interested in um, altered states. Mescaline was one of the drugs that was used then before LSD was synthesized. Um, and then, you know, with, with in the 50s, 60s, um, you did get people like uh, Richard Ward, um, Ernst Jünger, who was Hoffman's friend, Hoffman uh, synthesized LSD. Um, these philosophers writing about it and Aldous Huxley popularized it and he used Bergson's philosophy or a sort of bastardization of Bergson's philosophy to to um, frame it but um, you know I think one of the reasons that philosophy never really picked it up in the 20th century was or the mid mid to late 20th century and 21st century is because you know um, in philosophy of mind at least um, there was a real reductivism so like uh, you know, like in the 1930s, Alfred Jules Eyre wrote an essay, you know, like something like Why Metaphysics is Nonsense. I can't remember the exact title, but something like that. And it sort of, it, there, was, there, was a, there was a kind of move away from metaphysics, partly because in Oxford and Cambridge and some Scottish universities, um, absolute idealism, British idealism was like very popular um, doctrine. Um, and there was a kind of movement away from that um, to a kind of logical behavior, logical positivism and so on. And uh, ah. Hello, neighbour, and uh, and so yeah, and then you know, logic. There was also behaviourism with Skinner in psychology, and there was a general sort of demeanment of consciousness, like the the very existence of consciousness, and um, and you know, unfortunately, this kind of high point of reductivism coincided with uh, the sixties. You know, when 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 um, psychedelic use got out of hand, and. Um, and so there wasn't very much interest in it. And then, of course, you know, from 19, late 60s and then globally to 1971, there was a prohibition on psychedelic drugs. 
And then, of course, you know, it was just kind of illegal to experiment with it anyway. And then all the propaganda about it, sort of frying your brain and so on, which is a tool of trades, you know, for some philosophers. So, um, yeah, all these sort of factors came together to sort of just, um, sh you know, sort of dissolve any interest in yeah. psychedelics, which is crazy, really, because it's, you know, if you want to study the mind, why not look at these extreme forms of mind? Yeah, it's interesting that you bring in the like the 60s, but then also at that time, it's also the scientific revolution or really you know behaviorism and psychology and so it's interesting that even the study of metaphysics itself was kind of ignored no actually we have science now we can just look at little tiny things reductionism um even stephen hawking and 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 uh, that um philosopher we don't even need it anymore right so so you know to to get straight into it you know why psychedelics what do we learn about the universe from studying them um huh. Well, and I'm, oh gosh, so many things. I mean, at the moment, I so I've I've moved into the psychology department at Exeter um, because there's so much uh, potential mental health benefits from psychedelics. So, in one, you know, there are many layers of of what we can learn from them. I think, but in one, in this clinical layer, one can learn things about oneself. Um, you know, hard truths, um, ways of. The psychedelics seem to um, enable the evocation of lost memories, traumatic memories, which you can then work 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 on again in a sort of safer environment and more analytic um, in a more analytic frame of mind. Um, so that's you know one thing we can learn from them. You know things about ourselves, our own psyches, and so on. Um, on a on another level, I think we can learn. Well, you know, very simply, we can we understand that you know how we understand consciousness so the phenomenology that Husserl and Heidegger and people like that carried out um it's just like part of what is possible you know there's many forms of consciousness that are simply uh work simply ignored by phenomenologists so we we gain a much richer phenomenology like in terms of you know I don't know um different forms of time or, or the perception of time novel qualia so like um senses that haven't even got names so not colors not sounds not sense something completely alien you know and then sort of that you know that's on a phenomenological level but you know on an ontological level it relates to universals plato's forms you know as oh, the debate about that for example you know where, where have these qualia been you know um um and then you know even more than that um, I've written about like Spinoza's philosophy in relation to certain psychedelic experiences. So, um, you know, Spinoza talks about, he, he, he identifies mind and body as the same thing. This is why he was Einstein's favorite philosopher. But um, he does talk about a third kind of knowledge, which is rare, difficult and rare to achieve. And it's a, he calls it um, intuition. Um, and... Um, you know, perhaps psychedelics can not simply uh, give us hallucinations, but sort of, you know, they can deliver certain veridical states, which metaphysics can kind of like seek to understand, um, which, you know, might be dismissed as complete, complete delusion by many. But of course, to, to uh, say something's delusion depends on whether you know what reality is and and so there's an interest really interest i mean this is my latest one of my main last papers was about metaphysics and psychedelics um it, for for research and therapy and the point there was that um we can understand many psychedelic experiences it seems through metaphysical theories and this hasn't been done because therapists clinicians haven't really don't know much about metaphysics obviously so there's a real room for philosophy i think in in uh, psychedelic assisted therapy um, this is a project that I'm pursuing at the moment. Um, as well as those forms of knowledge, I think, you know, um, uh, in the philosophy of mind, at least, you know, uh, there's there are things that psychedelic experience can seem to um, falsify, is not the right word, but dis disprove. So, like, um, you know, logical behaviorism, the view that mental states don't exist, but are merely uh, sort of types of behavior. I think you can have the most amazing experiences just lying down, right? So it seems to be a falsification of that. Um, also, the notion that intentionality is the essential um, mark of the mental from Brentano, like, you know, so thought is always about something. You can love something's loved and hate something's hated. That's kind of disproved from certain psychedelic states. You know, you can have forms of experience that are seemingly not about anything. Um, you know, 
So that's just a taster of the kind of applications that psychedelics can give uh, uh, researchers and consciousness. I really like that 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 strand of thinking about psychology and yeah, in the clinic room, therapeutic techniques. Like if we can learn more about the mind and then even actually the the world and that they, people inhabit memories, and then you can help people have sort of yeah interesting experiences. Um, and but I suppose I mean and then to pick up on another strand, the problem with these kinds of things is that as you say, people will say they're they're hallucinations and therefore they're not real. So and this is just this is just fascinating because like you know you, you I talk, I did talk to Carl Friston as we we talked about off the air and, and in a way he kind of says that hallucinations are you know and we, we look at we can see what his views are but you know in a way you can people argue it's just you know your mind making things up mm -hmm. you now have no external stimulus and the external stimulus is the real important thing so i mean what would you say about the the ontological realness mm -hmm. of these states it's very interesting right um what is there is there anything more to be said there I mean, it's not, I don't want to comment too much on this um, free energy principle, particular processing theory uh, about consciousness, but I'll just say it is a theory and it's, um, you know, I'm skeptical of it to an extent um, for various reasons. Uh, and I mean, okay, the most general reason is it's still a form of emergentism. So, it's for, you know, theory that, you know, mind emerges from the brain. And this is never explained in the theory. This is just an axiom. But this is a fundamental metaphysical viewpoint, you know, that the mind emerges from the brain rather than that it is identical to it or, um, you know, and or that the brain or the material of the brain is fundamental. I mean, a lot of that stuff, you know, there's a Kantian influence on this theory that we project, you know, space, time, causality, you know, and so on. Um, but of course, Kant was an idealist. So, you know, the fundamental... Uh, underlying substratum of that was not brain it was mind you know so all these kind of uh assumptions made in this in in this theory um to my eyes means that you know they are unproved and so as a result you can't say something else is a delusion based on a theory that itself is very questionable now i'm not saying it's wrong necessarily you know like i say i haven't really properly studied it so i don't want to comment on it but um, generally speaking, emergentism is like just one theory of mind. This is a sub subtype of that, it seems. And, um, and and there are so many problems with emergentism, you know, related to mental causation, for example, uh, through the exclusion problem, if, if some of your viewers know about this. So, um, yeah, so I, I still say that one should keep an open mind with regard to calling anything a delusion. Obviously, you know, psychedelics do, do uh, provoke hallucinations. Uh, the question is whether they do always provoke them you know which is another question so I, yeah, yeah. I, I would i would just say yeah you have one has to keep an open mind about it yeah and, and you mentioned panpsychism there so would you be able to speak a bit about what emergentism is and what panpsychism is and why and especially why psychedelics might call us to to think about why panpsychism might actually be quite plausible uh yeah okay well first thing i'll say there's a, a study by chris timmerman and others in imperial college two years ago uh, also on um, how psychedelics seem to shift people's metaphysical views. It's a general shift from physicalism to panpsychism. Um, panpsychism, for those who don't know, means that, you know, um, minds are ubiquitous throughout nature. So in man, mouse, molecule, and beyond, plants, fungi, you know. Um, basic, you know, like basic forms, not in jackets, for example, though, because they are aggregates, so not in rocks and tables and stuff like that so you know nuanced forms of it different varieties of panpsychism as well um but anyway yeah so psychedelics seem to shift people towards that kind of more mind base i'll say this i don't think the the definition of panpsychism in these papers are particularly robust so they kind of push and and yussi yulka has done a really great study it seems um on this as well which seems to indicate that people uh he calls it idealism but i think generally speaking what one can say that they push; they seem to push people into a view where mind is more important than it generally is taken to be in early 21st century Western thought. So maybe that's idealism, you know, the view that we project, you know, the mind projects reality, or maybe it's panpsychism that minds exist throughout nature, or maybe even forms of dualism, mind and matter are separate. Um, yeah, so that's that's the sort of empirical findings. 
Um, but you have to be a bit sceptical about that because I think empirical findings can be based on like trends in society. You know, if people expect this kind of thing, then they're more maybe more likely to interpret it like that. Um, it's also kind of the demographic was very Western, so when when you look at the Americas, you get different kind of views. The question is whether they are fundamentally, you know, um, can be the same. This is an interesting project, an old debate. Perennialism as against contextualism. Um, why? Well, what is... Okay, so and why the interest in panpsychism? So what the interesting thing, first of all, is that if people's views do change to something which is categorized as panpsychism, um, I suppose like, there's two questions here. Like Number one, why does that happen? Number two... Um, you know, what is panpsychism and has it got anything going for it? You know, because again, it seems like a lot of psychedelic experiences, it seems like a crazy thing to believe in a particular Western culture at the moment. Um, it wasn't in the past, of course, you know, in ancient Greece, you know, that you know, Plato and Aristotle they thought plants had basic forms of desire and so on. You know, it seems that we changed with the 17th century in the scientific revolution, where with you know. Descartes, especially where, you know, matter became completely soulless. So, you know, and humans had souls and the rest of nature was extension, mathematical, geometric space. So you can trace the reasons why people think panpsychism must be wrong. If you look at that kind of metaphysical viewpoint, which was kind of a change from the Aristotelianism, which was very common in the West and scholastics until that point. Um, so at that point, then we got rid of, well, the scientific conception got rid of the teleological view of the world that there were purposes in nature, aims in nature, and it got rid of um, the view of nature as ensouled in any way or alive or has any intrinsic value. So that's, well, this is all negative. <laughs> this is just kind of preamble to saying this is why people think partly panpsychism's nuts. But I think, you know, it's not nuts. Um, I mean, essentially... It's a parsimonious view, I think, you know, that mind is matter. It uh, brings it all together. And, they're, you know, in this monistic strand of panpsychism that I've, I put forward, which is related to Spinoza's view, for example. Um, and if mind is matter, you know, that means that, yeah, OK, the more complex the matter, the more complex the mind. So humans have um, a very complex form of mind or, or some some people do, um, because you, you know, correlated to the complex brain, the complex nervous system, body and so on. Um, and like a cell has, you know, relatively simple, well, still complex, but a relatively simple um, body and thus a relatively simple mind, maybe just basic desire or fear or, happy, you know, joy or so on. Um, and, uh, you know, why why would you not believe this? Um, well, partly because of the historical reasons I said, but also another reason is um, the kind of neuroessentialism, um, which is a kind of, a, again, another axiom, which uh, is never really... Well, it is questioned, but it's not generally questioned um, amongst us, which is the view that the brain is a necessary and sufficient condition for consciousness. Now, this proposition is not verifiable and it's not falsifiable. It's not really a scientific proposition, in other words. It's a metaphysical assumption, um, you know, because of the problem of other minds, the problem... Pro, the, the the fact that the mind the, one aspect of the mind is debatable of course is that it's private you know I, I can I have access to my memories from yesterday you have access to yours but not vice versa I can maybe infer them from your behavior what you say and if you know brain imaging perhaps but there's never a direct access to it in the same way which means that mind is fundamentally non-empirical that's what privacy means uh, and some people argue privacy is the core mark of the mental you know beyond intentionality beyond a spatiality and so on um, so we cannot know whether, we cannot empirically know whether, you know, for example, plants have any form of intrinsic value. So there's always an assumption that they haven't. It's also an assumption that the brain is necessary. And this leads to all kinds of problems. So let's not assume that. Let's assume that matter is an abstraction. In other words, part, our understanding of matter is only part of what matter really is. And that if we were to know it concretely, this is one of the arguments, um, we would realize that it has an element of mind to it. Bertrand Russell put forward this this view, for example, Whitehead, you know, Spinoza, Leibniz. A lot of great thinkers believed this, uh, but it never really made it to mainstream. I think we've kind of we've been hijacked by a certain kind of quite dogmatic metaphysic, um, which, you know, even changes our experiments. You know,
experiments. You know, we do experiments to see find the neural correlates of consciousness. Why not look at the whole body, for example? Perhaps mm -hmm. we'll find other correlates. And why stop at the body even? Then you get into the extended mind theories. So yeah, um, so yeah, so so that's kind of a negative argument for panpsychism. In other words, the opposite of it is doesn't doesn't work, right? Well, yeah, or at least it's not definite. You know, there's, there's mm. based on assumptions. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's the start. Well, well, just just to comment on that, it's it's fascinating because I suppose in before coming across people, your work, also people like Bernardo Castrop, I kind of thought that any view other than sort of uh, materialism or um, you know emergentism kind of just was kind of wacky as you kind of say um, then it's fascinating to hear that you know that's actually in a way a more recent invention because people like Plato and and philosophers in the past actually thought this is pretty plausible and maybe they would even look at us and how we sort of develop philosophy and go wait you know why uh, why are all the the yeah. assumptions and, and then in we're in a we're in a fashion, you know, like the philosophy is going in fashion, and we're in a sort of century, a few centuries long fashion now of thinking about the mind in a certain way, which mm. might change, you know. But sorry, I cut into no, 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 and and um, and I guess and even as you say there, like, uh, it's not that. I mean, maybe we'll find out that 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 the, maybe there's some way to to say that material emergentism could be right. It's not like com completely off the table, but there's also as you say and, and as you write in your book, there's actually just it's just to say that the brain causes consciousness is just, it might, but uh, it's just an assumption. Um, so and where do, where do you draw the line? I mean, do you include what, what kind of brains are even like? So do you include, you know, an octopus brain, very different from ours, the brain of a bat, um, a bee, an ant? Um, they've done experiments with jellyfish recently showing that they can learn without, without brains. You know, starfish seem to adapt to the environment without brains and so on. Plants, likewise, you know, you can see... You know, Gustav Fechner, who who uh, sort of founded psychophysics, he was a panpsychist, and he argued that, you know, we just because we correlate our nerves to mental states in humans uh, doesn't mean that these are necessary uh, conditions. So, like, the analogy he makes with with musical instruments, he says, you know, every time, let's say, someone's someone's only heard music through, through stringed instruments, guitars, lutes, you know, so in harpsichords, and then one day they think, therefore, you know, stringed instruments are the necessary conditions for... Um, music, and then one day they hear a flute. You know, and they're like, okay, actually, there are other conditions. You know, we don't know it's a necessary condition. We just don't know that. And of course, that also relates to uh, modern ideas about AI or artificial sentience, rather. You know, whether machines can be conscious. You know, so if they could, it would mean they would have they wouldn't have brains. Obviously, they might have something, uh, you know, based on brains, but not necessarily. Right. And if you accept that, then why not accept it in plants as well? When you realize that they can. You know, they can see through their eyes, you know, simply they can't focus, but they can sense different forms of light. The latest experiments have shown they can hear water, some of them can, so on and so forth. You know, they adapt to their environment. They seek out, they have preferences. They seek out certain prey rather than others. And why not see the whole plant as a kind of moving brain? And when you, when you say that there, like about AI, it, it makes me think that maybe it's a bit, you know, even dangerous to just assume what and what does not have consciousness because you know you need to you know actually carefully think about you know you you create things that have have these kinds of intelligence and, and competencies and it's not immediately obvious you know what and if they have yeah. internal states i mean i mean one thing that, that i've talked to a lot of biologists um in someone called michael levin's lab and they do like loads of cool things with like single-celled organisms and showing like that they ca they can move they have they can learn things and it's like it just gets weird because you're like, you know, <laughs> you jellyfish. I mean, go to single-celled organisms; they can do things, and you're like, did they obviously don't have brains? Um, they don't even have a nerve, a nerve cell. They are a cell, a uh, single cell, and uh, and they're, they're yeah. So it's yeah, just um, the, the sort of range. Well, so it's, 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 yeah, that we've assumed too much. I think you know, with with, with like brains, you know, essentially. Also, you know, the, the brain, you know, the concept brain is a, is an abstraction. You know, the brain literally, concretely, is linked to you know the whole nervous system going through the body and that in its in turn is linked to the you know the other organs and tissues of the body and so on and that in turn is linked to the external environment you know so um why cut off why cut it off you know immediately i was i was listening to part of your interview with carl friston and he said you know the brain is completely uh, closed off to the external environment you know all it gets is senses you know like impulses from um you know the eyes and whatever but actually 
you know, those impulses come from the outside world, you know. They come from, like light comes from the outside world, hits the eye, goes to the, the visual cortex and so on, you know. That's one long process. There's no, like, um, artificial cutoff point where suddenly it starts from the eye inwards, you know. It's one process, and this part of process philosophy, and it relates to extended mind, you know. And so when you cut it off like that, you're kind of making artificial cuts in reality. Same with the brain, you know, you cut it off, at, you know, at the neck, as it were. You're making a, an artificial cut, you know. In reality, this is one long, one whole interactive system between brain, body, and external world. You know, there's no yeah. artificial cut, really. Would you be able to speak a bit more about process philosophy? I think I think people like like Bergson because it's, it's a fascinating concept that you know you can say that there is this clear separation and and maybe there is but like um, the light from, from like I think stars and things as you mentioned in your book. Wait, I mean that's like yeah. it, I, I really do like well, like a extended mind um, um, work in, in in cognitive science because it's like wait where where does the the, the, the stop or even you know philosopher like Merleau Ponty and just like that like hold up you know don't stop the phenomenology at what we can you know, see, but like we're just, we're completely in our surroundings and technologies we use have become part of us. And so, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you do stop, if you just artificially cut from, let's say, you know, the senses to the brain or the brain's own sense, sense organs, as it were, you've got then the problem of, well, how then does that organ, which is part of the physical world, then represent the physical world? You know, it's our problem of consciousness, really. It's sort of, indi like, again, indicative that something's seriously wrong with the whole theory. This is the emergentism I was talking about in relation to those other theories. Um, uh, process philosophy, yeah. Uh, so, I'd, I was also a physicalist, materialist, like like you were, and then I read, and then I was taught Bergson, Henri Bergson's philosophy in uh, Warwick University with uh, Keith Ansel Pearson, who's a good scholar in it, and Bergson Nietzsche. And um, it changed my life. I was like, oh my, you know, gosh, that's like... <laughs> You know, sort of opened up all these possibilities because I, I would all before then, you know, as a young, you know, teenager, basically, I just thought, well, you know, there's like, you know, serious study of the brain and so on, and then there's religion, which is wrong. I thought at the time, you know, and uh, and the, the, you know, let the two never meet. But with process philosophy, um, we realised that there's much, there are many more options. And Bergson's part of process philosophy. I, as I'm interested in Bergson and Whitehead as process philosophers. People often say Whitehead is like the, the sort of godfather of process philosophy, but really a lot he borrowed a lot from Bergson, and there's a lot of similarities there. And Bergson sort of well, they're kind of contemporaries, but Bergson put the theory out there first, really. Um, although Whitehead might have systematized it a little more. But anyway, the th the theory is um, well, it's a large body of it's broad church, but. So essentially the view that there are not things, there are not substances, you know, like brains and cups and, and so on. Everything, you know, we, all of these things are abstractions. So um, Whitehead's got this great fallacy called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, where you mistake an abstraction for the actual concrete thing. Concrete meaning sufficient, full thing. Um, so even my cup of tea here, you know, you think it's just, you know, a cup and you can model it in a computer with the geometry. But actually, you know, the reality is... Um, it has a great sun gravity, for example, you know, around it, the light that bounces off it is part of it, so on and so forth. You know, the scent emanating from it, the heat emanating from it. This is, it's really um, various events, this cup, you know, uh, that we, that will last a long time, you know, maybe it will last 50 years, this cup or whatever. But essentially it's an event like a parade or something, um, which mm -hmm. comes and goes. Mm -hmm. um, there's no actual, you can't sort of zoom in and find something that is um, like substantially there. Even the atoms would be processes, you know, in Whitehead, Whitehead's theory. So um, that's one form of why, one reason why it's called process philosophy. So everything is um, in action, as it were. Um, but more than that, like I was saying, there's this interesting, it's kind of like a proto extended mind theory, you could say. And I still actually think it's more advanced than current. <laughs> extended mind th theories really which are influenced um, but it's the view and I'm now generalizing from Bergson and and Whitehead that you know you mentioned the star that I said so when you when you see a star or let's say the sun as a star um, the sun itself is not a sphere you know the sun the sun rays are part of the sun they are one process we say sun words um, rarefy things you know into static bits but really the sun is one long process so it, will, it, it came into existence it will go um, it emanates light, you know, electromagnetic rays. That is part of it. Those electric man magnetic um, rays uh, hit the eye, can hit the eye, and you know that process. Then you know continues. Can the sunlight, as it were, the process of it continues through the brain, 
um, and you get this the whole um, perception of the sun is a is a is a is a is a sort of circuit, you know, is a process itself. And so when we talk about neural correlates of consciousness, we should really talk about physical correlates of consciousness at the least. Because, you know, you, you cut, you know, you cut the um, optic nerve and of course you won't see the sun, but you cut the, you know, the sun's rays with the cloud, you also won't see it, right? So that, that cutting applies throughout. So that's another aspect of process philosophy. Um, more than that, you know, interestingly as well, and this is probably a bit more white than Bergson, although it's in Bergson, um, you know, even like the word light or electromagnetism is an abstraction, you know, from what they consider to be more fully fledged emotional energy. So, um, you know, light contains within it a certain feeling, you know, very primitive feeling. So when, when you're sunbathing or whatever, or, um, you, you, you're absor whilst seeing the sun, you're also absorbing feeling because that's part of it. It's part of you. So rather than the view that, you know, like there's an emotionless void out there, the universe, you know, or nature or whatever, um, you know, there's intrinsic value within each thing because of the panpsychism there. Panpsychism more in Whitehead than Bergson, I should say. Whitehead, Bergson leaves it to life only, whereas Whitehead says everything is life, even molecules, right? So there's no organic, inorganic dichotomy for Whitehead. Uh, he's a bit more extreme, I suppose. But anyway, because there's intrinsic value in things, in including electromagnetism, uh, that is absorbed within us. And uh, this is, you know, this is a part not the whole, but part of the reason why we have emotional reactions to at different places, atmospheres, and so on, because we're absorbing mm. the emotions around us, you know. But we think those emotions can't be that out there; they must be just in here. But then again, that's a kind of neuroessentialism where you think, well, only emotions must only come from me and my brain, rather than anything else. You know? So, yeah, multifaceted church of theories, process philosophy, quite fascinating, different way of looking at the world. It's more sort of aligned with. You know, ecological views probably. We see that with Arne Ness, the founder of deep ecology, the Norwegian philosopher. He based, you know, he he based deep ecology very much on Spinoza, but then later on Heidegger and Whitehead, and, and then some other things. But uh, yeah, it's a very different way of looking at the world, really. F. H. Bradley, as well, the absolute idealist, he was also sort of spoke about this view that you know emotions were a bit more like clouds that you would walk into, you know, you didn't, mm. and they're yeah. thus shared, you know. So. Well, it's sort of one one thing that comes to mind is how we are so wrapped up in our own culture and and modern like your own time. I mean, I'm sure everyone is in 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 every sort of culture, but you know, when you mention philosophers that have alternative views, but even like it makes me think of like ancient cultures or your you know um, shamanistic cultures, sort of even like animism. You know, like I'm. It sounds a bit absurd to me, you know, saying light has like emotions and things, but but that's just because even panpsychism is maybe still a bit weird and hard for me. But you know, if you if you just being surrounded in the view that the universe has agency, you know, you 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 can imagine completely different ways of of yeah. seeing things, and it's, it's it's as well like when you open up to these possibilities, it's not like. It can like it can kind of give you insights into uh, how things work. It's not like it's it's not just like a because in a way in our in our world today it can be easy to go oh that's fascinating maybe that's true but but anyway because you know you still have to then be grounded in this world and people mm -hmm. you know it's slightly changing but people are still reductionistic and so yeah yeah absolutely you know Bergson writes about you know the fact that even um, you know part of the reason why we do conceptualize things into why we do um, um, commit the fallacy of verification all the time is because of language, you know, like to get on in the world we have to, well, yeah, nowadays we have to at least create words, language for things, which means we sort of concept, we just make them all distinct, but so this is a kind of natural way of behaving and it leads to natural metaphysic, but it's uh, you know, language can be very misleading according to him. Yeah. But yeah, One more thing I say about that, yeah, absolutely, I, I understand that, and I, you know, I change my views quite a lot really, I think um, but there's no there's no essentially like default view. There's no like, mm, you know, maybe, yeah, interesting thought, but I have to return to reality. Right? <laughs> because again, we don't know what reality is, you know, like every single theory is highly problematic. Even like the emergentist view, which is very common today, brain creates mind, you know, it's like, how? This is the hard problem of consciousness, like serious, serious problem, which is suggests that something seriously wrong with the, like, the theory generally. So um, there's no like, uh, unfortunately, there's no anchor, you know, we're kind of swaying through the ocean, not knowing where we should land, where we should stop. 
Um, and so that everything kind of be, well, I don't, not everything becomes possible. So there are obviously like theories that are, um, you know, just don't have much going for them, like not good reasons and not good evidence either, you know. Um, so the, I think the problem is, you know, like if you become too open minded to anything, then, you know, anything goes. I'm not saying that, you know, like there, everything I've, I've, I don't, well, I hope so. <laughs> everything I mentioned, I think has good reasons for it, you know, they're not perfect. There are, always criticisms against anything but you know in terms of rational plausibility i think you know there, there's you, one can make the argument at least and see the flaws in critics arguments um, which often are implicit rather than explicit i like that you bring up language and how like because it's how that cuts up the world it's definitely intimately related to process philosophy and the fact that, as you say, like your 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 mug is is like kind of a parade. It's you know from our time span, it's pretty concrete. Fifty years time, that's 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 ages. But but then you know uh, to to a an, some entity that just exists for ages, like that's that's it yeah. sees the mug as gone in a, a flash. Or um, and I like that in your work, you bring in like look at other organisms and like what time scales are they seeing at you know uh, a fly is going to look at us and like we, we look ridiculously slow and 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 then you kind of need to think that yeah objects kind of they they have this, this flowiness to it um uh have you have you looked into uh or read a ian mcgilchrist's work um in the different hemispheres yeah Every, everyone asks that question of me and i feel like i really <laughs> should and i have got um, one of his older books um but i haven't read it yet um i just haven't got around to it but speaking to i mean i know he's very much influenced by whitehead and speaking to whiteheadians it seems to me they say well he's he's read whitehead he hasn't read secondary literature from whitehead you know which they they didn't like so much <laughs> but um so i'm looking forward to reading it eventually i know he's got a two volume um workout yeah. recently, uh which i really need to get round to but i've just got um a list of yeah i know I need to do before that but i will one day i hope to meet him one day actually yeah, okay he lives on the other side of britain doesn't he in, in higher scotland whereas i'm in, I'm in lowest cornwall here. oh maybe i'll make it happen and get you two on a podcast together um mm. it's, it's difficult with him because yeah, he has a, a, this you know tomb two book uh, uh series now out but I, I, I haven't even finished reading his old book and it's been two years because it's so <laughs> dense and it's great but but the reason i bring him up um is just that um you know you mentioned that language cuts up the world but like you know language is also something which has kind of uh evolved into us it doesn't seem like we well maybe we always had it but like he kind of argues in in his books that and there's many other people that think this that language emerged from things like music and and in a way music is kind of a um and and a more holistic thing um you can't ignore the whole the parts the patterns and um, mm. together um where and, and sometimes i think that even today in like the last even decades the language has become more like we were so focused on like you said this word now like this this means that and it's like okay but it's a word and you can kind of get get sort of uh, hung up on it so so that's why i bring him up yeah yeah okay well i, sh I should look into him yeah um Alan Watts as well also, I must say, wrote about the sort of uh, words. I, th I think he was influenced by Whitehead, but the sort of uh, tendency of words to mislead people. In But the good thing about Alan Watts is he, he, he uh, explains it in really beautiful analogies, metaphors and so on, using language actually in a nice way to say that language is limited. Okay, interesting. So, uh, yeah, look at Chris, Alan Watts. I have read a fair dose of Alan Watts, I must say. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, in, in this podcast we've kind of like when we talk about like psychedelics and psychedelic experiences kind of um sort of make it sound like broad brush like oh yeah the normal experiences and then all these other weird experiences but um i mean what would you say to like what are the differences between different psychedelics or like dreams like is it like completely different realms like well, how can we try and have a sort of taxonomy to for thinking about yeah. these kinds of things um well yeah, the first thing to say is, you know, there's a broad range of psychedelic experiences, um, as there is a broad range of, you know, prosaic normal experiences, as it were. So it's hard to generalize, but, um, you know, there have been attempts to, I think there's, there are taxonomies emerging. There's this, um, James Sanders and, and others are working on micro phenomenology of psychedelic states. So that's really trying to, you know, like, get the details of what really happened and you know, like if you, you can say you know i became one with god or something but what does that really mean what did you really feel so these there is a lot of interesting work on this taxonomy of psychedelic phenomenology at the moment um 
I would say, you know, like also different. It's very a lot of variables. So you know, the classic one, set and setting. So if you're in a, you know, you should always be in a good mindset and a safe, comfortable setting. They say, um, but setting seems to um, and set your memories, your lifestyle seems to impact the experience itself. So interesting how a lot of memories which you maybe you thought were lost seem to flood back during psychedelics this is the basis of a lot of the psychedelic therapy as well you know like bringing back traumatic incidents from childhood and so on uh, that's also interestingly interesting metaphysically because someone like Bergson for example one of his radical claims is that um, memories never lost you know just access to it is lost um, but so so yeah like bringing back you know past memories um, similar to what's it called um panoramic memory you know near, through near-death experiences where you see your whole life flash before your eyes this can happen there's a number of reports of that that's one form um there are other forms such as um uh <laughs> so many different forms yeah. a lot a lot of visual <laughs> forms a lot of re repeated patterns and so on um there are um there are there are types which um completely differ from anything visual so like uh, with 5-MeO DMT for example you'll have an experience which uh, starts with uh, a white light but then becomes completely nonsensible uh, and, I mean nonsensual nonsense sensual no senses involved no colors or anything like that um, maybe it's not sensible to take it either that's an another meaning <laughs> but um, yeah so so you get but but the, and also the sense of time stops this is why I took it actually once because um, I was interested in that. Um, and then even at high, high dose of LSD, you'll get very different sort of experiences to low doses. So that's another variable, the dosage. So you've got like, all these variables, set, setting, um, uh, type of substance, you've got a uh, dose of substance. Maybe people from different cultures when, will experience, with all of that, they'll still have very different experiences. So this is the, again, the argument from contextualism that your cultural context determines your actual experience not just the interpretation of it there's a really interesting debate at the moment which has been reignited as it were with the psychedelic renaissance 10 years ago it was a debate in mysticism studies before that um so the other view is that like from william james huxley people like this perennialism which is the view that um you know um a, a peak a so-called core peak experience um such an experience will be the same, qualitatively identical throughout cultures and times and places. Uh, perennialism. Um, this is the opposite then of contextualism, and this yeah, this debate debate continues, and uh, it's very interesting. I can take a middle path myself. What else can I say about psychedelic experiences? I mean, you know, time and space they they distort. Um, time can slow down. Speech at the present moment can seem to extend. Um, time can speed up um, space you know there are reports of seeing space of more than three dimensions like especially through DMT um, yeah so I mean I really can't do justice to the full array of, of experiences mm, mm. but you know they're not just simply like kaleidoscopic colours that's part of it that's kind of an annoying part you want to move fast you know it's like um, well there's an aesthetics to it but there's much more than that it's also feelings of, uh, you know, different kinds of feelings that you've never had and affinities with nature, nature connectedness, very common. Um, all of which is, you know, pretty to work on, you know, I think through with philosophers, phenomenologists, because like, like I said at the beginning of this talk, um, you know, um, it was an unfortunate timing that psychedelics became popular in the 60s when reductivism was not interested in consciousness at all, let alone psychedelic consciousness. Hmm. So a couple of fascinating things that I want to pick up on. I mean, um, one is that uh, different like cultures might experience, say, the same substance differently. I mean, think about like what people hear about psychedelics like oh this, this is going to be really dangerous or no this is going to be great and like yeah that must surely change things and even like you know contemporary scientific theories in cognitive science about expectations and bringing in top-down models i mean that that too and it, it must um and um i mean as well like uh it's 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 fascinating that i often think about in in everyday life i mean it's not that every life is 
boring but you realize you're doing very similar things you know all the time and so you know even like one psychedelic experience is going to like completely change what you kind of think is possible um and and that just makes me kind of want to ask you know there is these wide range of experiences you know um who if anyone like should be taking them like like is it like beneficial what kinds of experiences um and maybe is that even the wrong term should be is that too utilitarian like this substance is beneficial and this substance isn't you know well you know at the moment um the see it seems to me some people disagree with this but it seems to me that the only way to make psychedelic substances uh legal is to go through the medical framework at the moment you know because it seems unethical to stop you know trying to help people um but I see that as important. It helps. Does I think it can help people. But after that, I think there are greater uses still. You know, and it's not just for the unhealthy. Scare quotes. Um, how can I help? How does it help people? What was your question, sir? How does it help? Yeah, people? how does it like? I mean, obviously, it's interesting you bring up that medical. Obviously, there are people like trying to go. Okay, you have this specific medical ailment, but as you say, like, would I would love to get into like ways in which beyond that in some future where it's not just like medical treatments. Yeah. Right. What, what ways do you envisage that uh, these substances might ben benefit us, change us? I mean, you know, I always, when I always think about the Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece, which were um, sort of like, you know, the most established of the mystery cults in ancient Greece. They, la they lasted, the Eleusinian mysteries lasted 2000 years, you know, longer than Christianity really at the moment. Um, and they were now it was, it's not absolutely it's, there's no hard evidence that people took psychedelics in these mysteries although there's some evidence actually from spain recently but they took a potion and they entered a darkened temple and they certainly had it seems what we would define as a mystical experience however it was occasioned um and this wasn't to cure people you know it wasn't for the sick it was for everyone you know people believe that all athenians went there including the great philosophers plato aristotle and so on um so why because it seems although it was forbidden to speak about the mysteries so we don't know too much about them um it seems like one of the reasons was to cure the fear of death i suppose that is kind of like helping a kind of ailment we all have like thanatophobia i think it's called the uh, fear of death um well that's what one thing um so i think that psychedelics could be used for end of life care for example i mean that there's experiments on that already i guess that's still therapy though isn't it i think beyond that I mean, you can only can only speculate here, but it would be, um, you know, if you look at like Santa Dime, these these are uh, um, Native American churches generally, you know, um, their purpose is not therapy so much. It's like a greater, let's just say, to generalize, like an enrichment of life. So, you know, you don't have to go to musical concerts, you don't have to listen to music, but if you do, it enriches your life. Um, same with psychedelics, I think, you know, it can give you different insights into yourself, into the world, different ways of thinking, even if it is delusion, like at least if it, even if it is cool, complete, complete hallucination, still it enriches your life, just like dreams do, you know, just like music does, you know, we don't say that, well, music is not factual, so therefore, what's the value in it, you know, it's, it's it has a different kind of value, psychedelics do as well. Um, also, yeah, and so I think that, like, you know, one could foresee a future where psychedelics are used as a kind of um, institutional, as an institute, really, a bit like the, the mysteries, um, to just provide, to enrich people's lives, to make them see the world in different ways, in other words, not to sort of um, take people away from dogmatism, perhaps, and um, just, in, you know, allow people to experience more of reality than they otherwise would, because, you know, Although the veridicality is at question with a lot of these psychedelic experiences, you know, the object of truth of what is seen, um, the actual experience is real. And, you know, in other words, it happens. And some people experiencing that, they, you can get a lot out of it just through that. I should uh, add a warning, though. It's not for everyone, you know, um, really. So there are there are reports. There are many, you know, bad, bad trips that happen as well. You know, people get very anxious. For example, um, you, you, you know, I've got a lot of gothic imagery you know, like satanic stuff, uh, which I'm fine with, but I think a lot of people wouldn't be. Um, I've heard of horrific incidents, for example, where people think they're in a void of nothingness infinitely and they will never escape. 
things like that, you know, can't be good for you, really. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so that, you know, it comes with a warning. So there are extreme, basically, you get extreme, you can get extreme experiences. And generally, I think most people get a lot out of them, just like fascination for a start, if not, th you know, self therapy. But um, yeah, there's a dark side to them as well. Strangely, just like with dreams, there are also nightmares, which are r rarer, but they happen. I like that you bring up the, the kind of dark side and the dangers because I mean, I guess they're extreme experiences, so you can get extreme good, but extreme bad. But you know, when when we start taking them more seriously and you realize like I mean, whatever the ontological grounding like that you have a real experience like you know that does it does does that you know the, but the dangers of it should people i mean it's weird i mean do, do, do you think that like um because we don't understand a lot about them right i mean we also don't have a cultural grounding when you talk about certain setting like like if people have like these strange experiences of being in a void maybe you know a shaman you know thousands of years ago be like, oh it's obvious you're having this kind of experience but but you know in our time it's like what on earth are you supposed to do with these yeah. kinds yeah, of experiences it's, it's, we're disconnected from them i mean you know the mysteries were shut down by the christians or theodosius the first in the fourth century a.d and you know like uh it's part of the history of consciousness really i think um, then kind of spiritual life was then monopolized by the church. Um, and, you know, we lost connection to these other views, you know, on, a, on an institutional uh, level, at least you're right. So, yeah. And when LSD was thrown into the US, you know, it's like people were like, what the hell is, you know, what's going on? You know, it's like a, like a bomb thrown into culture there. So it was press partly probably. Um, so yeah, you would need to begin to uh, establish certain protocols perhaps you know certain frameworks to understand it this is why i'm i'm pushing for this like um metaphysical framework like uh like a metaphysical menu of understanding different psychedelic experiences not to impose it in any way but just to say look you can see it in this way and that way just pro and you know different forms of clinical therapy are being um, developed now uh, protocols um uh you know we're in Exeter, actually, we're offering a first uh, postgraduate certificate in psychedelic studies to sort of make this more academic as well, starting in January next year, next month. Awesome. Um, yeah, so um, the, I think this can be developed, but at the moment, yeah, we're very, at a very early stage where we just don't really know what's going on. You're right. <laughs> but, I think not, but, but it's just so intrinsically fascinating that everyone wants to know. And like I say, um, you know, research in the 50s 60s was therapeutic there was a lot of positive results from that with Stan Groff people like this you know Hoffman or whatever um, and then it got out of hand with partly due to Timothy Leary you know who gave it to his students um, then it was suppressed by Nixon and the, and the UN um, but but now in the last 10 years we've seen okay let's let's take these seriously again and you know re reinvestigate their therapeutic potential their general potential and it seems yeah. like if we're careful now you know we don't overdo it um, it can develop into something could develop into something really fantastic the danger is that um things are overstated dangers are minimized um right-wing press daily mail or whatever starts criticizing it and then the whole thing kind of blows up again like it did before mm. it's it's you know even one reason i say like to acknowledge like like darker dangerous experiences is that if if people people are going to have have some because i mean i don't think it's like it, it's maybe not, not possible to like get rid of all of them or if you know if you did you're going to make it so dulled down and so small doses it's no point doing it and so then so people need to you know then you can have the daily mail go oh wait you know this one person had this experience yeah, like, yeah they they did um so so like in a way that's it's kind of um sometimes i think essential it's inevitable but i mean um you know always uh compare it to other drugs which are legal like alcohol i mean you know for most of us in britain at least it, it you know greases the social cogs as they say it's generally good uh, but, uh, you know, there's a high percentage, actually, of, you know, cirrhosis of the liver, violence, uh, you know, accidents, driving accidents, whatever, that come with it. So if we're going to be consistent, we should say, well, if we're going to ban these because a small percentage are not positive, then we should ban alcohol, cigarettes and sugar even, you know, right? So, you know, so then it becomes a political, ethical question about, you know, what's the basis of prohibition? I wanted to ask you about Friedrich Nietzsche because because he he took psychedelics that influenced his philosophy, but also that his his um his philosophical views are kind of in a way sometimes similar to the things we've talked about here. So and so as a final thing, like can you speak about him and how that he's influenced you? Yeah, well, I uh, you know 
I think, well, how he influenced me generally when I was, you know, a teenager, I started reading him and he suddenly, he was like a psychedelic drug. He just like, whoa, <laughs> just like, what the hell? He completely reversed, inversed my view of reality in many ways, just, just because he's so brilliant at bringing up axioms again it comes down to presuppositions you know priors or whatever you know he he brings them to light says so like we assume this but why what's the basis of it and then he traces it back using the genealogical method traces back to like you know i don't know the christian um um triumph over the romans for example you know and you know the basis of our ethics is you know very questionable if you don't believe in, you know god is dead he's famously said and what that really means is if you don't believe in the Christian God, then you have got no right to Christian morality. And you might think, well, I'm not Christian, that's fine. But actually, Christian morality has um, embedded itself within Western culture. So so even if you're unaware of it, um, it, it does affect you. So, you know, so, so that's how... And it also, he's just extremely psychologically insightful. So it's not just priors about, you know, cultural ethics. It's also about, you know, how you think about yourself and so on. Anyway, so uh, the interesting thing about... Yeah, so that's... So Nietzsche's just a great philosopher generally, maybe more psychologist, really. I'm beginning to see him more as a psychologist than a philosopher in many ways. But, I mean, he was trained philologist, you know, like, so someone who uh, uh, researched the history of language. But anyway, he took a lot of drugs. So when he was a child, he, he suffered severe uh, migraines. He, has, he had myopia, probably related, you know, like bad vision. And um, he, had to, he took six months out of school, even, this very prestigious school he went to. Um, and, uh, that's never really, he suffered, he suffered ill health all his life, you know? Um, and then some people think he got syphilis from prostitute and this is why he went insane, but this is questioned, you know, his father died of like softening of the brain and, um, his mother and sister of ill repute, um, believe that his drug use actually made him insane and they looked after him for 10 years. So. Anyway, so we don't know why why he collapsed in 1889. He died 10 years later in 1900. But he took a lot of drugs to firstly mitigate the pain I think he was suffering, you know. And so he took a lot of opium, high doses. Uh, there's a report that he's he said that flowers were swirling around him. Uh, he took uh, potassium nitrate, um, even possibly some kind of cocaine mixture. Um, in fact, we don't really know. It was not documented what he took, except in from reports of others and some of his own letters. But he was also like a disciple of the philosopher Dionysus in his early work and his later work, you know. And when he went mad, he signed off his letters as as Dionysus himself. Dionysus, the Greek god of intoxication, wine, dance, intoxication. And he wrote some poems about the poppy, you know, the opium flower. Um, I've got a whole essay on it in my book, Numenautics, of course, but um, the argument is that um, he, he, his philosophy was partly inspired by these other s mental states that he experienced. I mean, including like auditory hallucinations, it seems. You know, he, inspiration, he actually heard like Socrates' muse, you know, he got, he received, as it were, he, he sort of said um, information, insights and whatever. One can only speculate about that, but the fact of the matter is he did take a lot of drugs and because as a doctor of philology, well, as a doctor, he was allowed into pharmacies to get whatever he wanted, any drug he wanted. They never asked a doctor in what. So they just assumed he was a medical doctor. But but anyway, as a result, he probably, yeah, he, he quite put. Well, we know his friend actually said that he took all kinds of things, um, which he didn't, she didn't even know what it was. So uh, yeah, no, very interesting history of his drug drug use. Uh, if you're interested, though, yes, yeah, in my book, Pneumonautics, there's a chapter called uh, um, Psych uh, Antichrist Psychonaut about that. And it just sort of references all his drugs and known drugs and, and so on and how it relates to his philosophy and so on. Mm. And, and, his, and, his, yeah. Yeah, and his views on like the, the like, core part of his work on the will to power and this, this sort of intrinsic sort of force you know, within or matter i'm gonna say matter but i mean like what like the, can his views be squared with panpsychism uh like like what well, how how do you think we yeah. should think about his philosophy well, well the funny thing is i got into panpsychism through nietzsche right so um the will to power is is uh it's an old thing in philosophy you know it's like i mean it was essentially i suppose initially inspired by schopenhauer's will to live will to survive the survival instinct um but also you know like in philosophy we see it in Spinoza called the Canatus, you know, it's the 
um, the uh, the was what do you say the, the to per- persevere in one's own being. So to to survive, but also to develop, you get that in 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 Spinoza, Leibniz, a dominant monad, and so on. There's basically a way of individuating beings is to say that there's a kind of fundamental drive that they have. Nietzsche called it will to power, which was quite German militaristic way of looking at it. Villers Macht, but um, really it just means a desire to develop. Right. So that survival is the lowest level of that. Um, you know, you can't develop your power um, if you're not alive. So. So then the, the will to survive is um, sublated into the will to power. So, okay, so once you've survived, though, the, the drive continues to develop, you know. Now, that could just mean simply, you know, getting a degree, getting a job, house, whatever, or it can mean more than that. It doesn't necessarily mean greed. It also includes growth, you know, and so on, creativity. Um, so, but, yeah, for Nietzsche, there's different readings of the will to power, but... Um, I take the reading looking at his notebooks. So he was, he was um, it's my view that he was developing this theory into a metaphysical theory, even though he was ostensibly anti-metaphysician, uh, anti, anti-metaphysical, but he, uh, he, this was a metaphysics because it was something that underlay, underlied the physical. And, um, not that metaphysics means beyond physicality, of course, it doesn't, it's based on Aristotle's book, metaphysics, but, um, is a kind of view that you know fun- underlying all of physicality there is a drive to develop and that is kind of panpsychism you know because it's a psychological drive it's a feeling it's a pathos he calls that pathos so um yeah so so that sort of i i was intrigued by that and then i you know after Nietzsche, i read schopenhauer influenced him and he's you know almost you know karl popper called schopenhauer a kantian turned panpsychist and uh, you know, and then I sort of started investigating it, and his ins- inspirations through Spinoza and so on, Leibniz and Kant did entertain the idea of panpsychism, but rejected it in the third critique. Anyway, so yeah, so so I, th- I think that the will to power can be seen as a as a type of panpsychism, if you define panpsychism as not simply like consciousness or like you know, um, yeah. Um, access consciousness but including subconscious drives as well um and if you understand the will to power in the way that i just put it which he does put it he, which is more in his notebooks than his published work so there's questions about that but ultimately where he put it doesn't matter you know the 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 the, the, the important thing is the truth of it <laughs> truth of matter right? so uh yeah um so yeah that's i do see think you can see nietzsche as a panpsychist of sorts interesting um i've really enjoyed this podcast so and i have nothing more to ask so any last words anything you you would like to have covered and and where can people find your work um not really i've enjoyed this talk thanks for your questions i think very insightful um i just say yeah i've got a website philosopher.eu if you're interested in more um you can see my books there some public articles private articles uh, and so on so uh, yeah just have a look at that okay yeah thank you very much thank you 